Shall we go? Okay, I thought someone was going to introduce all of us, but I mean, but hi, I'm so glad all of you are here today and to those of you watching online. My name is Lisa Friedman, um, and we are here today to discuss air pollution, the, climate, the, the intersection of climate change and air pollution, um, and some of the work that's being done around COP26. Um, there's a, you know, a growing body of research showing that climate change is contributing to a wide range of health problems around the world, and at the same time, the sources, the same sources of emissions that are responsible for climate change are also causing significant damage to public health. So reducing fossil fuel emissions from power plants, autos, and other sources will also cut pollutants like nitrous oxides and black carbon. Um, air pollution results in about 7 million premature deaths every year, and I think that's just one of the concerning statistics we're going to hear today with this fabulous panel that I'm lucky enough to, to be speaking with. Um, directly to my right, we have Bavreen Kandahari. Hello. From, uh, who, who leads the, the warrior moms in India. Hello. Next to her, Jane Burston. She is the Clean Air Fund's founding executive director. It's a global philanthropic initiative that supports organizations around the world working to combat outdoor air pollution. And finally, Camilla Kad... I had it right before. Please, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. Camila Kajitulowska. Don't Thank worry, you. it's really difficult. I signing. practiced it, you, you, you <laughs> congratulated <laughs> me, and then I choked. Um, Camila has, has three boys with respiratory problems, and, um, and that's how, what brought her into this, this movement um, of moms addressing air pollution. She's also a documentary filmmaker, um, and we're eager to hear more about that. But I, Jane, I, I wanted to start with you. Um, can you first tell, explain to us, give, give us the 50 cent tour of the intersection between climate change and air pollution and why we have to address this in tandem? Um, so uh, climate change and air pollution are linked because they have the same sources, um, primarily the burning of fossil fuels. We know that fossil fuels account for the vast majority of the greenhouse gases that are warming the planet when they're extracted and when they're burned. And burning them also accounts for about two-thirds of the air pollution that harms our health. Oh. So if the, if the causes are the same, the solutions can also be the same. Um, they're also linked because um, sometimes the pollutants that harm our health are also bad for the climate, and black carbon that you mentioned earlier is one of those examples. And can I say, I know everybody here has a very personal story, but I, I read that your entry into dealing with air pollution issues was almost collapsing from, from heat exhaustion at a marathon. Tell us, tell us. Yeah, well, actually, my, my first experience of, um, of really kind of seeing air pollution for the first time was when I first moved to London. Um, and I was cycling to work and had a, had a mask like most, most cyclists in heavy traffic and just looking at that mask at the end of the week and seeing how black it was wow. uh, and thinking, you know, what could be going into my lungs and probably what was getting through the mask and going into my lungs was the first time it really kind of struck me how polluted our air is, even in places like London where you can't even see it often. Um, but yeah, then uh, later working, um, I started working in climate change, but collapsed in the, running a marathon and had this near-death experience about how I really needed to up the game on uh, campaigning for, for our right to breathe clean air. And, and can I ask you, especially because we have two moms here, tell us a little bit about um, why air pollution is particularly dangerous to children. Um, well, children are... Um, often more exposed to pollution. You know, they uh, play, spend a lot more time outside, playing outside. They breathe closer to the ground, and some sources of pollution are you know, particulate matter. is heavy stuff in the atmosphere that, that um, is therefore more concentrated closer to the ground. And they're more vulnerable physiologically because they're growing. So it really affects children's lungs and brain development and the development of all of their organs to the extent that actually it even affects unborn babies when, when pregnant women breathe uh, dirty air. 
uh, we've seen in studies that look at placentas, they've actually found particulate matter inside of a placenta. Wow. So doctors think that that's the way that pollution gets through to unborn babies. And what it means is that babies born in more polluted areas, have a, they're born smaller or they're born more early. And um, both of those two things affect children's health for the rest of their lives. Wow. Favreen, India is home to 37 of the 50 most polluted cities in the world. Tell us a little bit about your work and what you're trying to do in India. Yes, um, uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, and uh, not, uh, you know, recent. It's been pretty much for many years. And uh, I was a mom, and uh, even before that, uh, there, was a, there was a lack of uh, knowledge or lack of uh, information. I'm talking about the year, say, 1999 or 2000, when uh, no one would believe that the air is dirty. You know, it was... There was not much evidence. Nobody knew what AQI is or... Um, Tell us what uh, AQR is. Yeah, AQI is an air quality index uh, that we... You know, that's our way of measuring the air quality. And right now, uh, Glasgow is 20. And back home in Delhi, which is the most polluted capital of the world, my daughters are breathing of over 500. Wow. And that is extremely hazardous, very, very severe. So as I say, I, there was, I can say that a million times and I get goose pimples because uh, that's what we've done to our children. They've grown up from the, as a baby and may, in those days we didn't even know that the placenta, this, there were no studies, they were recent now, that when I, probably I was pregnant I didn't know the placenta was also damaged and that my child in Delhi, who's the newborn baby, is a smoker. You know, there is no baby in that, that city that is a non-smoker. So this doesn't affect our leaders and our politicians, and uh, we continue the same, uh, uh, same things. I'm saying that over and over again, and everybody is talking about it. The Google says it, you know it, I know it, but yeah, we are still there. So, uh, well, um, for me, my girls uh, grew up in this, and uh, that's why this became very important to uh, you know, fight for them. The, as we know in the whole world... Forgive me, how old are your girls now? They're 17 now, yeah, 17 years. That yeah. this started when you, you started fighting for yeah, this before, when they were Yeah, before, even before that, but it was less aggressive. It was more about advocacy because no one knew anything about air pollution in India. And we knew water was dirty. So unfortunately, what happens with air is that, you know, you, you can't see, air, you know, air. Water, when you see dirty, you tend to leave a glass. None of us will ever drink that glass of water. But you, I tell you, okay, come to Delhi, I'm inviting you, and you'll still come and do, because you don't want to believe that that air is probably w more toxic than um, the water that you're drinking, and it's poison, and uh, somebody is feeding poison to your child, how would I react? I should be, you know, so aggressive and killing them, but I'm not doing that. So it's one thing that the policymakers and the government is apathetic, and the other is the citizens are ignorant. When we don't ask for something, we don't get it. What we ask for, you know, when we know the masses will ask for something, that's how, uh, you know, the politicians will give in. So uh, they were playing basketball. My girls were playing basketball, and uh, I was learning that when any child who's playing, uh, you know, a sport in, a, uh, in an, any AQI about 350 or 400, uh, was me, it meant like I'm killing them, you know. Now it was battling between, uh, you know, whether those teenage girls will back off, you know, because they've practiced, you know, 10 years of their lives and they'll give up a sport, or I'm going to, you know, the school refuses to believe that because, because our own policies are like that. There is uh, no sense of measurement, there are no monitors, people, people don't know about it, so they wouldn't agree with, you know, calling it off. Yeah, so, I remember in. Um during the Obama administration in the United States, our EPA yeah. um, uh, started to post online air quality monitors in, in Delhi, and it, it raised a lot of, yeah, yeah, of that's, anger and concern. And, and I wonder what year was that, because... Um, I'd yeah. have to go up and yeah. look. But can, can I ask, I mean, what is it like to be, um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe you could tell us some, some specific examples of um, being a, a lobby of moms going up against coal industry lobbyists, power plant lobbyists? Absolutely, it's been, um, uh, you know, very overwhelming and beautiful with, you know, moms all over. I have there on the audience as well, there are these 500 parent groups all over the world. 
So this is something common, and I say that, that 93% of kids all over the world are affected by air pollution. So that means even the kids of the politicians and the leaders, I mean, their children are suffering too. So we, we are all, the common thing that we have is we are all parents and grandparents, you know, and we should be all striving to do that together. And, uh, and it's been, uh, you know, all these parent groups have been strong. The moms have come over, you know, mostly mothers, of course, fathers too, but mostly they're all mothers because uh, as we know that the mothers will jump into fire to even, mm -hmm. you know, save your own children. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a, like a, in Indian mythology, we have many such stories of uh, moms, mom, mother is the savior. So the earth is the mother, you know. So, uh, this is uh, what it is, and uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, something to really reckon on, and uh, I hope the leaders will understand that everybody suffers, even their children and grandchildren will. So those, uh, 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 you know, the asks are very, very legit on fossil fuels, and yeah. yeah, which need to be taken up very, very seriously. And I want to circle back to, to what this means here at COP, but Camilla, I, I you know, um, all three of your, your sons, I understand, have respiratory health issues. Tell me how, how you got into this issue okay. and, and their story. Um, my story isn't special. It's the story of most of the parents of uh, small children in Poland. Um, I have never ever thought that I will have to fight for something so obvious, like right to breathe the clean air. But becoming parents 12 years ago, I was totally unaware of the point we are in. I knew that there is something strange about the fact that in my country, autumn, winter, and spring stinks. If you come there, you can realize that there is a smell in the air, mm. but everyone is used to it. Everyone thinks it's, it was always like that, yeah. And in my country, every small child is um, in this season from September to April, is constantly having respiratory problems. The same was with my first son, and I, I can't forget this um, pilgrimage to the hospitals we, we used to have. And um, the same was with my second son. He was born really as a strong, beautiful boy, and after three months, he was diagnosed as a child who is uh, permanently handicapped and ill because of cytomegalia. And Hopefully, it was the moment I accepted that, um, well, our son will be um, un unaware to hear and see us and perceive the world like the other children, then I was said that, no, sorry, we made a mistake. It's because you are breastfeeding him and it's you who is constantly sick. And me as a pregnant mom and mom who just delivered, I, I didn't pay attention on my health, but this is also something very, very important that the yeah. pollution is affecting not only our children, but also pregnant women, also those who are um, vulnerable and elderly people as well. So because I was constantly ill and I was breastfeeding my son, he couldn't gain on weight, he couldn't sleep, he was all the time struggling for survival. And then the doctor told me like, please first you need to get Someone needs to cure you. You cannot have these problems, respiratory problems, all the time. And it was true. After I got cured, my son uh, also gained on weight. And we realized that for, for the three months of his life, when he was born, he was getting uh, the polluted air to breathe. Wow. And uh, his mother was sick, was breastfeeding him. So he, he, could not, he didn't have any chance to um, have this first time and develop properly. So now he's... Uh, he's still having uh, problems with, right? How did that translate into advocacy and, and you know, coming on sort of the global stage to, to advocate for clean air? Um, how did it turn out for me? Yes. Yes, um, I have to tell you that at that moment, it w I had to become mother of my third son. Again, the same story, born happily, healthy, rather healthy son and then having on and on these respiratory problems. And then we went for a journey with, with, with uh, the father of my child for a long journey, having sick children. We went to doctor and said, we, we have this trip. It's totally different part of the world, but well, and we went there and we realized that our children get cured. After five days of being in different clean environment, 
When we came back to Poland, after a few days, they became sick again. And then the doctor I, I had the conversation with, I said, like, it has to be related with the pollution. Why no one is talking about that? And the doctor told me, like, well, we are not set to talk about this because all our Polish uh, heating system and energy system is based on coal. And uh, if I say to the parents, they will, they will get rebel or um, all the pharmacological um, system will collapse because then I, I give you the proper medicine and not uh, many, many other medicines that you need to buy and uh, um, provide your children with for, for many, many uh, times. So, so I decided that I cannot on, accept that. Yeah, so the dependence on fossil fuels is, is so ingrained even in the health system that there's a reluctance to Absolutely. discuss the source of yeah. health problems. Now it hopefully children. changed. There are wonderful organizations like Hill Polska. I re they are really doing a great job. And together with some doctors, they are going to public and explaining to people that we, sh we cannot accept the fact that, that we are breathing such a toxic air. We are having the most polluted air in the European Union. And our policymakers are aware of this since at least 200 years, because the year 2000, um, because we had this uh, report on that. And after entering European Union in 2004, they were said that we have to make this quick um, energy and heating transformation to get rid of the problem. And we are at the same point in 2021. They've done nothing. 87% yeah. of the coal, European coal is burned in Polish houses. And, and we can come back to Poland's decision yesterday to join and then, and then backpedal a little on, on a coal pledge. But yeah. I, I want to ask you, Jane, you, your organization recently released a report uh, that found action to, produce, to, to reduce air pollution receives less than 1% of, of government development assistance. Um, that's pretty startling. Tell us a, a little bit about yeah, that. It's, Why? It's, it is really startling. And um, we also found that uh, money from official donors, so development agencies and development banks, uh, more of that went to projects that prolong fossil fuel use, 21% more over the last two years, than to projects that reduce air pollution. Mm. So even through the government investment that richer governments are giving into um, uh, lower and middle income countries to, to help their populations, it's, um, it's really ruining their health. One of the projects in particular was this um, Madupi power plant oh, yeah. in South Africa that received more than two and a half billion in um, aid finance. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's been calculated to be killing more than 350 people a year, every year because of air pollution. So, uh, and we, and we, and we, I mean, another, another example from, um, from the COP, the UNFCCC has produced a synthesis report looking at our climate change and air pollution being tackled together in the nationally determined contributions from each country. And they found that only 7% of the countries um, are looking at both together. They're only 7% are looking at the short-lived climate forces. So yeah. can I ask, you know, Bravin and Camilla, you know, Obviously, we are all focused here at COP26 on climate change. How, how hard is it to, you know, or maybe it's not. I mean, you tell me, I mean, how hard is it to break through with the message of we, you know, we, this isn't just about climate change. This is also about traditional air pollutants that are hurting and, and killing um, in, in all, all over the world. Let me, let me start with, with you. And yeah. How are you getting that message out So uh, it is, I mean, uh, the parent groups, is that's exactly what I feel the common thing that Jane and Camilla and myself, we're all here. I think we're all desperate moms, you know, who are looking for that, uh, you know, health, which is, uh, or a right to life, which is really a right, you know, which, uh, you know, we've all been saying that uh, uh, there is something that we should not be asking, you know, for our children. And um, unfortunately, that uh, the, um, the governments and the leaders don't see life as so big now, and they see the money more. And like, you know, it's so sad, those 350 lives a year don't matter anything to them. But when you show them the money, that matters. And uh, that's why the whole narrative, as I see, and been changing about talking about money and not about lives. Actually, let me pause on that, because I thought that was so interesting. We were discussing this um, backstage a little while ago. Yeah. You have found over the years that that the money argument 
yeah. uh, resonates more with lawmakers than the moral imperative yeah. of reducing. Which is so sad. Because, because how does one feel? I mean, like I said again, that they're, they're, it's their kids as well. And what, what, how do what, you feel? What is the financial argument that you fin make? What is so, the so like argument? for India, I would say that last year, this is a study that just came in um, a couple of weeks ago. We spent about $87 billion on uh, uh, just all these catastrophes, the climate crisis catastrophes. Yep. And then we're asking for money here. Why are we asking for money? Because we, you did not correct what needed to be. The, all the sources of pollution have, have to be strictly curbed. Yeah. You know, the fact that I'm sitting here again in another year and uh, in this month uh, we have crazy, 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 you know, air quality index and uh, it's hazardous, uh, you know, severe, you're not allowed to go out of the house. You know, so all that, it, it, it shows that we are not uh, really concerned. Every Third child in Delhi has damaged lungs. This was a recent study. It was not a questionnaire study, it was a spirometry study which Lung Care Foundation, some of the doctors, they conducted and put in a lot of hard work. Yeah. And every third child has da damaged lungs. Well, this is so heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, and, and, and these are studies which are being done on and off because they could be worse. I mean, you never know. There could be something worse that's happening. So why don't we have that urgency to solve it? And the urgency means that we have to, uh, like I said, it's poison. Uh, fossil fuel is a poison. It needs to go. Uh, why is India not, uh, uh, you know, dodging on all the pledges, whether it's coal or whether it's uh, methane or it's deforestation? Uh, in the most uh, polluted capital where I'm coming from, they're cutting one tree every hour. You know, why are we doing that? Why are we looking at new, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, they call that new, uh, <laughs> you know, all this solar and the new mm -hmm. energy uh, solutions while the most natural oxygen towers or uh, the climate change soldiers are the trees and you're cutting them and you, uh, you know, the co you're giving them to the coal blocks. So it's yeah. just simply ridiculous, and uh, I'm angry about that. And as parents, I'm also the voice of so much, war so many warrior moms, and all these wonderful moms. And I just, we are angry, and we are very disturbed and very disappointed. Which brings me to the letter. Your delegation of moms yeah. is here. You've been trying to deliver a letter to Alak Sharma. What what do you have to say to the president of COPS at 26? Um. I really would love him to um, do everything what's possible to keep away the policymakers that are taking profits from keeping the fossil fuel industry, to keep them away from taking decisions on our children's future. Because as long as it's them who decide about the climate policy, our children are lost. They are put as a sacrifice. They have their lives and the future are sacrificed for for the profits of the policymakers and fuzzy fuel lobby. And this is how it looks like. This is, our gen this is the generation of our kids and of the teenagers that are on the streets right now. So um, I would, <sighs> my dream would be that um, we have responsible leaders who are able to match the challenges of this decade and not people who keep us tucked into this what uh, is killing us and making our world divided and uh, causing so many violent conflicts all around the world. It's so obvious, it's so obvious and it's for us parents when we realize that we are actually we are left alone with this, we have no choice. We, we have to speak up and, and say that as voters, as taxpayers, we are not going to accept that. And this is our demand, to take the climate crisis and the pollution issue and loss of the biodiversity, the three most important challenges for this decade, seriously. And do not cooperate with policymakers who are taking profits from fossil fuels. This would be, for me, as a person coming from Poland, um, which is making such a huge, huge greenwashing right now, and pretending to act and saying that we are not ready. Well, we citizens, we say it in every statistics, we are ready and we want to have the ambitious climate policy. We, from our own pockets, are investing like hell in the renewable mm -hmm. energy, but it's our government who sees it and is blocking it. And instead of this, our policymakers prefer to invest lots of money again in sustaining the, the system based on coal and gas 
um, which is making us actually dependent from Russia. And uh, we, as parents, we have to speak up and say that we are aware, enough, it's enough. Yeah. I, I wonder, and, and this is front of you, do, do you feel like pollution and clean air issues are getting the attention that they deserve at this conference? I wish. No. I, no. Why not? No, well, not at all. I mean, even the first day when the WHO came in and I was, uh, I tweeted that, I said, why aren't they talking about air pollution? We're talking about health. But health is one that air pollution comes even more uh, critical right now. It's much more critical. And we should be talking that separately. You know, mm. we appreciate mm. that we're talking about it here and, you know. But so far, we've not seen, I don't know, do you feel yeah, the same? Yeah, I mean, this is the first COP that, where the WHO has even had a stand or a, press, a formal presence mm -hmm. at the COP. So this is how slow uh, the policymakers are to bring any health yeah, and climate exactly. issues to the yeah. fore. Yeah. Yeah. I think the WHO is doing a great job of telling us all how polluting, fo burning fossil fuels is and how we need to stop that. I mean, they, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the, the session that the WHO stat that seven million people every year are dying from pollution, which is just a phenomenally big number. It's 15% of all deaths, half, more than half a million of those are children under the age of five. Um, mm. And so is it getting the attention it deserves? No, nowhere near. Uh, and this, but you know, um, Camilla and Bavreen and, and the other moms who are at, actually at the moment delivering um, the letter to Alok Sharma in the conference center are doing their absolute utmost to to make, make a noise and make sure that uh, it's brought to policymakers' attention. You know, we have a few minutes before we open things up for, for audience questions. I wanted to um, have a, a conversation about, b before we turn to, to the audience, about air quality and inequality. Um, yeah. We, you know, at the, at the New York Times, one of my colleagues did a, um, did a, pretty uh, incredible yes. story some, some I think that, last yeah. year yes, yes. Well, on India, um, right, I mean, uh, showing sort of the, the air that children breathe. Yeah. A in whole day routine that is taken. And, yeah, the whole, nice. in yeah. middle class neighborhoods yeah. versus yeah. Yeah. poor neighborhoods. Obviously, because uh, uh, anyway, we know that, that any kind of a crisis, any kind of a, a climate change uh, issue is the first, the most vulnerable will get affected first and get more affected as well. Yeah. So this is exactly with air pollution because uh, we, India is where we have masses. It's not like here in Glasgow. I mean, I keep looking for, you know, everybody com seems comfortable, like, you know, it's a blessed community, but India is not like that. And we have people living in slums and on the roads and streets and, um, you know, I, th those people, for, don't, for them, the only savior is the natural, good air and the trees, and that's what we are taking away from them. So, so obviously, they, they suffer to a large extent. And um, we don't even consider them in, in our, you know, and, and they're the vote banks. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. so if, if there's anything else, again, like I talk of economy and vote banks, because we are so desperate and we want our leaders to please come on, and whatever you like, we'll do that for you. You give us clean air, you know, and give us a future for our children. And, uh, and of course, uh, even the, these people, these masses we're talking about who are suffering, taking a suffering, and they don't even have good health facilities, uh, you know, back home. Uh, how, how, do, how do you get a, you know, like a five trillion economy if you have everybody is sick, you mm -hmm. know, and everybody is uh, mm -hmm. fighting some disease? We've seen COVID was a disaster for the whole world. And I think that should be a lesson that, uh, you know, if, if, if we don't have health, good health, we have nothing. Yeah. I mean, we've all failed and this huge, you know, billion dollar losses. So again, money, but we've got to work towards it, you know. Camilla? And, um, yeah, uh, what's, what's really important um, is that a parent could ask themselves questions, what kind of future and, and also today they want for their child. Whenever they, they feel like these uh, issues are not so important. Do they really want their children to breathe polluted air uh, in, in damaged countries, surrounded by walls, and uh, um, affected by the climate disasters that are occurring in every part of the world at the moment, world at the moment or not? And there are parts of Poland, like Silesia, where children are the, the air 
children are breathing in is over 900 and sometimes even over 1,000 times more polluted than the air that children in France are breathing. And there were these examinations done by Tim Navrot, it's, it's um, a, a medical person from Belgium, as far as I know, uh, among the children in Silesia. And when mothers and parents discovered that, they, they, they just couldn't imagine that no one is doing anything about that. Um, but uh, the authorities keep on saying like, well, it's maybe just a small group of children. It's not that important because most probably they realize that yeah. if other parents realize that this problem is affecting their children as well, it's just the quest of not having this research done. It's, it's so just wet. the yeah. quest of not yeah. having the research and not yeah. supporting the research. There are also Pardon, can I, I make sure I understand? So, so are you saying that that there's a dearth of, of studies as well in, in Poland but, on um, the link between air pollution and as far as I know, um, there are th th these studies were made not by Polish uh, people but by T Tim Navrot, I think is he's French or Belgian, I'm not hundred percent right, sure. So there's but he he, he went there yeah. and, and he, he did this examination. And um, there are also, like in Silesia, there is one uh, doctor who is a uh, leader of a hospital and she's dealing with children sick on cancer. And she was doing her own research showing that children living in polluted areas are the children that are getting sick on brain cancer. And also no one is really supporting her examinations. Yeah. So yeah. there are tryings, uh, uh, but um, this, the issue is so, so serious that Perhaps there is this fear that if we all realize that we, we will just rebel and well, say enough. Yeah, and go, I, building on these points about inequalities, I think um, something that people don't often connect with air pollution is the inability of kids to get an education because of it. Uh, so that I mentioned earlier, their brain development is uh, put back if they're born in a very heavily polluted area. But even on single high air pollution days, well, in Delhi, for weeks of the year now, for the last two or three years, schools have actually had to close because yeah. it's unsafe for kids to go outside to get to the school. Um, but then even on single high days of air pollution, um, when the children can't concentrate, they can't learn. Yeah. And so we've seen, there's a, there's a really interesting study from economists uh, looking at school exam results in Israel. And what they compared was kids who'd done their final high school exams on a high air pollution day and kids who did their final high school exams on a low air pollution day. And uh, the kids who did their exams on a high air pollution day, because they were poisoned and they couldn't concentrate, they got worse marks and that translated to worse jobs and that translated to $30 a month less income for the rest of their lives. So if you think the schools that are more polluted and more polluted environments are way more likely to be low-income neighborhoods next to a busy road, next to an industri industrial facility, not have an air purifier. You know, that's an, it's just another thing holding those children back from living up yeah. to their full potential. What a fascinating domino effect. I'm, I'm interested to know the, the other variables on, on those days, but um, that, that is fascinating. I, um, I'm not sure if there's, let's see. Um, oh, there I can see. If, if anyone has, Questions, uh, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll point to you. We have microphones coming around. No? Yes? Gentleman in the front? If you could say your name and organization that you're with, too. So I'm from, I'm from the Clean Air Front. My name is Sean McGuire. I'm interested in solutions. Yeah. I'm interested in um, what the mothers think should be the priority actions that, would, that, that could the governments could take place. There are many, many possible solutions, but how do we help policymakers prioritize the smartest and fastest thing to do? Bavrin, let's start I, with you. Yeah. So, firstly, the intent, you know, because, um, you know, that if that's there, a well, lot can be done, but uh, usually that's missing with the politicians and policymakers. And um, fossil fuel, of course, as we a petition speaks about that, the fossil fuels need to go, period. I mean, we cannot you know, bargain on that, like some of our countries are doing that. It's not going to work. So, uh, and of course, there are challenges, like back home from my country, there are challenges because there's a lot, huge lot of employment and, you know, there's a system in place, but, uh, you know, we are not experts, we are moms. But I do understand that every change is difficult. Even if you change, move a furniture piece in your house, there's 
causes you a little, uh, you know, discomfort, and this will cause a little bit of discomfort. But eventually, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we'll come into a. So of course, taking uh, immediate account into which is happening, but uh, it's not good enough. It's not the speed or the, uh, you know, the effort that's being put in is not good enough. Is the renewable energies have to come in and the coal needs to go, but. Just before I've come, uh, in one of the states, uh, they were uh, protesting for years, actually, and they walked 300 kilometers, the tribals, to uh, save the forest, but that coal block was released just last month. So, so this, is, uh, the, this needs to stop, and uh, we need to uh, you know, work out, uh, bring these stakeholders in, who are the, uh, you know, I, I would say, even why not? We moms are stakeholders, too. I mean, our parents are, citizens are, uh, the tribals are. So, uh, so they have to be brought in, they have to be considered, you have to see that they are the important part of the system. So f first is, of course, the fossil fuels. There is no doubt about that. And then, uh, uh, like I said, the deforestation that comes along with it and uh, uh, huge forests or even in the city-wise, the trees and the most polluted, uh, you know, there has to be a strict, uh, like an embargo. I mean, till the time you come to an AQI 60, no tree should be cut. You know, it's as simple as that. But if we have development based on, uh, you know, priorities, then it's going to change. I saw so much renovations here in the city, which are so you're keeping your uh, buildings and the construction pretty much limited, and, you know, it's, it's being done. It's not, the same thing is not happening in Delhi, which is the most polluted. They run down everything and making it all over again. So that is a lot of construction dust. I mean, these are, these are small, you know, uh, measures that people like us and ordinary citizens can kind of suggest. Yeah, and, uh, and we I'm, see I'm that. I'm curious, you know, maybe Jane, who, who's doing it right? What, what countries or cities have strong PM 2.5 regulations? Who's, what, who's the model? <laughs> uh, well, interestingly, no uh, country or city has um, uh, ambient air quality guidelines in line with what the World Health Organization says none. is safe. Oh, none. Really? In oh, the no. world. None no. in the world. Uh, and, they, and there was none in the world even before the WHO just brought down those, what, what they think is safe. So uh, there's quite a long way to go everywhere, unfortunately. Um, there are, there's progress in some cities. We just saw uh, last week that in London they'd already put in place an ultra-low emission zone in the city centre. Um, which, for the year that that was in place, brought down nitrogen dioxide levels at the roadside by almost 50%. And last week, that zone got expanded to almost the whole of inner London. Wow. So if you've been there, at zone two and three, it's, it's the biggest clean air zone in the world. Um, that kind of thing, we, it, it charges for the most polluting vehicles. The vehicles not only drive within the zone, but then they drive everywhere else, so it helps outside of London as well. And it's that, those kind of policies, but much more quickly that we need to see developed. Mm -hmm. Other okay, questions sorry, if, out there? If I could add something, oh, yes, just, just one thing about the solutions. So, uh, it, yes. yeah, you see, the coronavirus shown us that it's possible to um, unite internationally and find the solutions. It didn't took us that long. And about that issue, every country has got the reports and knowledge on what's there to be done. As Parents for Future Poland, we are in touch with the scientists because we are not the scientists, but yeah. we are calling to experts and asking on how come that it's 87% of the European coal is still burned in our houses. And then the experts are explaining like, well, because police, the solution is doing this and this renovation. There is this report from this year, this expertise. You, you have the solutions here, but no one is taking them. So it's not on us parents to give the policymakers the solutions because they are they. It's just on us to stress on them that, that, that they need to do it. And the coronavirus uh, crisis has shown us that it is possible to act quickly, and we demand that. Yeah. Any hands? Maybe I can ask the three of you, you know, to, to go down the line and briefly tell us what, you know, um, what would be the best thing to come out of this particular COP on air pollution? Okay. Maybe can I start with you? Um, the best possible to, uh, outcome would be uh, that our that according to our demand in the letter, um, starting from now. All the money that are put into fossil fuel industry that is poisoning us and damaging the future of our children is put into the 
renewable energy that are mm. su such a basic things like keeping the forests as they are, are done and uh, making the regulations that are uh, allowing the Paris Agreement to, 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 to come true. So um, this is our dream and with on and on investing in, in this what's a problem, we will never get to the solution. So the swift, the, the changed perspective is something that I would dream to come out of the That's COP. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll just add to Kamala, which is right, and uh, I'd like to reply to him also here, because there's one thing that's not happening in India, and uh, I'm sure Jane knows more, is the implementing the norms and the regulations. Mm -hmm. So even mm -hmm. if you have a thermal power plant, and there are these regulations, but if they're not being implemented because the court will intervene and then you get extensions, you know, it just doesn't work. So, so it's not like uh, <laughs> we're so bad, we don't have the laws and there's no regulations, there are emissions, uh, you know, control, uh, you know, all the data. But it's, if it's not taken care of, then we're, it just doesn't matter because doesn't matter. all this data, research, studies, there are just so many now. It's not like 20 years ago, there is so much. And uh, if it's not implemented, then it's of no point. Yeah. You know, there is no need of all this. Yeah. I, the intent, like I said, in a capital I, N, T, N, T. If yeah. anybody wants to do it, it'll happen. You know, that's it. Jane, could you close us out? Top, yeah, best I, thing that could happen. This I mean, plus next one week. for both of those two things. Absolutely, um, an end to investment in fossil fuels in all of the many ways that that happens, whether it's overt or hidden. And I think uh, a commitment to tackling air pollution at the same time as climate change. You know, there's a way of doing this where they're not where they're tackled separately. And in some cases, some climate action actually makes pollution worse. So mm -hmm. making sure that every country in their NDCs is looking at air pollution at the same time as climate change, and we're using the, the limited funds that are available to make sure that we're, we're tackling both problems, not just one. Wonderful. I want to thank all of you so much thank for you. having this discussion with us today. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. I'd like to give you a round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.